Welcome to a place where conversations matter and truth matters even more. Today's episode is going to have a little bit of a different format, starting off with a little monologue, and then it's going to transition pretty quickly into a very casual conversation between Phil and I. The focus of today is the praise of Kamala Harris. I hope you enjoy. As professing Christian acquaintances of mine celebrate the inauguration of a black female vice president, I'm reminded of a compliment I was recently paid. Although I am too easily affected by words of praise sent my way, this left me with a slightly bitter taste in my mouth. It went something like this. I'm so glad we have you teaching chemistry here. I'm glad there's a female representation now. Wow, that was touching. I had a grand total of 0% to do with the fact that I'm female. It's like being complimented on being 31. Imagine this, and no, this is not me, just a theoretical person. You just get out of your fifth year in graduate school. You have three newly published papers, graduated summa cum laude, have 2,000 hours of community service, and just got hired at your dream job. After a few months in the job, a coworker pulls you aside, slightly choked up, and says, I wanted you to know, I'm glad there's someone who's here and is in their early 30s. What would your response be? Uh, wow, yeah, I guess, uh, you're welcome? It's a ridiculously empty and meaningless compliment. It speaks nothing to the talent, hard work, or character of the person. It reduces the person down to merely their immutable characteristics, which God should be celebrated for, not them. That's only part of the problem with identity politics. And make no mistake, all sides play a part in this. But Christian, you should not. 1 Samuel 16.7 is a good reminder of that. After God rejects Saul as king over Israel for his disobedience, God sends Samuel to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. The Lord says to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I could just stop here. However, that passage has been available to us for thousands of years, and yet we still have churches and individual believers celebrating the outward appearance. I can already hear at least one of the rebuttals. I'm not celebrating Kamala's blackness. I'm celebrating that we finally have black representation. My response. No, you're not. If you're celebrating black representation then you would have been celebrating our black Supreme Court Justice Thomas, our former black HHS Secretary Carson, our former black female Secretary of State Rice, our former black Secretary of State Powell, and you didn't, and you're not, because they don't fit the blackness you want them to vary. In a sense, they aren't the right black. Or perhaps you think you should celebrate Kamala Harris because she's a woman. Then let me ask you, what is a woman? Because in Kamala's world, anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman. Which means a woman is nothing. It's meaningless. Its definition is vague and diffuse. So you are celebrating a meaningless identifier that anyone or no one could have. So I'm officially confused. What are you celebrating? Over and over I heard from progressives who identified as Christians. How could you support someone like Trump? He has such terrible character. What's your definition of character, Progressive? Is it how someone presents on TV? Or maybe it's how the media presents them. Or is it what they write in a book? How would you compare the character of Donald Trump to Kamala Harris? If you easily answered, there's no comparison. Kamala is like pure refined gold compared to Trump's mercurious and riddled past. Maybe you could defend these little details from your golden girl. Kamala Harris slept with and dated a married, separated man, former San Francisco mayor, Willie Brown, when she was 29 and he was 60. She was appointed by Brown to her two well-paying state commissions, and Brown helped her in her first race for district attorney in San Francisco. She withheld exculpatory evidence against the accused as district attorney and held people past their parole for cheap labor. She colluded with Planned Parenthood as DA, 
who was and is a donor to her political campaigns, to punish Center for Medical Progress's undercover reporting on Planned Parenthood's fetal tissue harvesting and research programs. If you're going to think biblically, then she needs to be held to the same standard as the loathed former President Donald Trump. Partiality is a sin, James 2, 1 through 13. Unequal weights and measures are sinful, Proverbs 20, 23, and 11, 1. If you think your motivations are honorable because her policies give preference to the poor, then you need to read Exodus 23, 3. I implore you to cease from word search Christianity. Stop using the Bible as a proof text for your perception of justice and goodness. Get good Bible teaching. Join a church that exposits God's word. Define your words. Be perfect as the Lord is perfect. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro from every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In love, Danae. So we, we've talked about many times how we've been seeing this like uh, pattern of, I guess you give the term progressive Christians, but I don't really even know what to call some people now. I don't know how to cat- categorize certain people, but people who definitely lean left politically, and that is highly associated with people who lean left the- theologically. There's very tight association with the two of those. Yeah. According to many studies, specifically that Texas one that did I ever send that to you? Mm-mm. Is it not? Well, anyway, I could I could include that in show notes, but um, so we we've seen those types of patterns. We've seen this association with political leftness. We've seen the association with some sexual ethics and how people have. People who are professing Christians have taken that and driven it away from biblical sexual ethics. And there, it's always th- this pattern. There's always a pattern that follows that. Like if you deviate in one way from what the written word of God says, you start deviating in a lot of different ways. It's usually not just one thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and in at least in my experience, it's, a lot of people have started with the sexual ethic issue and they started embracing things like, even if people didn't go so far as saying like, oh, um, yeah, I think that homosexual marriage is no big deal. I think it's good in God's sight as long as you're like monogamous. Even if they didn't do that, they would use words or phrases like, well, we need to have a seat at the table for these people in our churches. We need in talking about the table of Christ, the the wedding supper of the Lamb. There's going to be all types of people there, and then you would see they would start to broaden on things like um, social justice issues. They would talk about the death penalty. They would talk about um, mass incarceration, and so you just would see a pattern at people, especially our age that would follow one light of thinking after another. It wasn't an isolated event. And when this first started happening, I thought, oh, these are just people that believe differently on this one issue, Um, but they'll come, they'll come around to it. And then I, then I saw that, no, they didn't come around to it. They would double down on it. They would start expanding their definitions even more. Then it started leading, leading more broadly into this deconstructionism of like tearing down Christianity for what it is in their experience and talking about the abuse that they had experienced in the church and how wrong largely the American church has been in treating, you know, gay issues, racial issues, any type of... And they're, what... very, they're very charitable and kind to the progressive people, even if those progressive and people... Yeah, that don't believe in Christ. yes. And they are extremely harsh and attribute the worst motives and uncharitable interpretations of interactions with people who would be 
easily classified as more conventional, fundamentalist, traditional. Now, yeah, and not even fundamentalist, just biblically minded Christian. What we would think of as biblically minded yeah. Christians, other people would call maybe conservative Christians mm-hmm. or traditional Christians or historical Christians, those that have continued historically in the faith. So they look at all the motivations of the people that agree with them in in politics, in culture, progressives, and like, well, they, yeah, maybe they're not right biblically, but they have really good motivations because they just care about people. They love people, but those bigoted traditional Christians, they're not acting out of love. They're acting out of oppression and hate and right. X, Y, and Z. Right. So it's totally, it's unequal weights and measures. It's something the Lord of Whores. Right. And it reminds me of when, I don't know if you remember this, but when AOC was saying that people, she had that interview and she said, people are so caught up in being technically correct and not morally right. And I was like, whoa, the, the, the very fact that you can separate the two of those things in a statement and say that there's a difference between being factually correct and morally right, um, to me is absurd. As Christians, we believe in, I don't remember what it's called, the try something, but it's the good, the beautiful, and the true all go together. So you can't be untruthful and good. You can't be untruthful and beautiful. All three of those are connected together. So if we say something that is true, that is a beautiful and a good thing. Even if it hurts. Even if it hurts. Now, I hear the pe- some, you know, some people's thoughts that could be popping up right now. Well, people don't always say it the right way. Okay, well, I, I would have two responses to that. One, yes, some people can be jerks, right? Um, but, but as a Christian, it's incumbent upon us to not look for errors in the way people, or I should say it like this, it's incumbent upon us to not be the tone police, right? Not policing everyone's tone and how they say it and how they come across, but to look in the content of what someone's saying, and you can critique that right? First, right? You're not looking to be offended. I think so often the people in our age group and this culture, we're looking for offense. We're looking to be bothered. We're looking to be aggressed in some way. So we pull apart. Oh, she said it kind of harsh here. He said it so dogmatically here. When in God's word is being dogmatic or being sharp, every sinful thing. Now, if you're starting to read into, and people start to read into the motivations of people's heart too, right? Which is really, and a really interesting thing to do, but I think it's another attempt at people looking to be aggressed and looking to be grieved by something. And so, um, like we've said before, so one thing is, yeah, people can be jerks about stuff. Why don't you just tell them, hey, this sounded like a like a rude thing to say or a rude way to say it. And correct them in that if you want. But I think But second, you don't get permission to throw out what they said. The content. Yeah, people yeah. throw out the content of what people say so quickly because I think primarily people find content to be offensive more than anything else. And they look into the tone of how people say it as it's an, an excuse. excuse. And so what I'm concerned about, I think, in the Christian culture is people slowly but steadily pulling away, away, away from Scripture, the Word of God, really being the reference point and being the anchor and using sociology, using even statistics, using anthropology, using social science, use it, whatever it is, that becomes their reference point for arguing anything. And so that brings up this current, what would you say, epic of the praise of Kamala Harris, right? Kamala has been praised in the media. She's Kamala? Kamala. Okay, sorry. Kamala. Kamala Harris. I'm pretty Harris. sure that's how it's pronounced. And there's a lot that's, that I, we could say negative about her and some positive things too, but the least we can do is try to Say get the name, name right. right. And so <laughs> I apologize if this is incorrect, but I did look up a video and I believe that it was Kamala. So I, I'm trying to remember it like comma, the punctuation la. mark, la. Yes. Kamala. Okay, not so, Kamala, not Camella, Carmela, I know it's whatever. Not, I know it's not Camella for sure. Kamala. I forgot what so, someone else called her. It was really bad. It was a botched name. But anyway, 
there's definitely this current wave of celebration that is happening in response to Kamala being the new vice president. Now, yes, it's in the media, right? Yes, it's in all the, like, the New York Times has something, like, every day about her. Yes, it's in the Washington Post. Yes, it's here. Yes, it's there. But what I'm concerned about is it seems like so many of these progressive Christians are sounding boards for the New York Times and the Washington Post. They basically adopted all this secular ideology and, like, put a couple Bible verses around it. And they're like, oh, but it's really, it's Christian. And there's a, there, I have a Christian motivation for being excited about Kamala being the new vice president. But, and this is this is the same as that new Georgia senator, uh, not Ossoff, what's the other one? R- Warnock. Warnock. The whole, like all I saw my acquaintance, any acquaintances, or like those who leaned left politically and, and um, identified as Christians, even like Lecrae, what I would see them praise was legitimately the fact that they were black. And for Kamala, that she was black and female. And I could not figure out what their biblical reason, because what their biblical reason for that was. And the reason I say that is because, okay, you say you're a Christian. So you do something that I think doesn't match up biblically. So what I'm looking for is, okay, what's your biblical reason for this? Right? Because As a Christian, like I've stated before, I want to believe what's good in you. I want to believe the best in you. I want to give you deference. I want to um, assume that you have a reason before assuming that you don't. So in order to follow through with that, I usually ask people, what's your reason for this? So I remember having a, a specific conversation. This was actually about Warnock, but it's in the same line of thinking. Um... I said, what, what is your reason for celebrating Warnock after very credible allegations from, I think his current wife or ex-wife, whatever, that he was abusing her? I mean, this is current, mm-hmm. from like 30 years ago, abusive, and that he covered up child sexual abuse scandals from his own uh, camp that he was like, I don't know if he was, he's the owner of He's like whatever. the director, the director. of a, a summer camp or a, a children's camp or something. And guaranteed... If that was going on with Donald Trump at the time, and I said something about how glad I was that Donald Trump won, you know, let's say the 2016 presidency, you know, if we went back in four years, five years, yeah, four years, um, I would be strung alive for that yeah. by, by progressive Christians. Well, there's a, there's a even more um, close parallel. Well, the, can I the, tell you what she said? Yeah, yeah. And then okay. I want to hear your parallel. So she said, oh, I'm excited because there's finally like black representation that, you know, young black men, after all these years of, you know, persecution and oppression, there's a black man in power that these younger black men can look up to. And I was like, what are they looking up to? The fact that he's black? (laughs) Like, what do you want them to grow up like him? Like... A wife beater and a child abuse coverer. Like wh- I don't understand what the point of having someone in power who is black and you're celebrating it if they have terrible character. And your whole contention about Trump was his character. That was their contention. And yeah, they didn't like his policies either. But people were not decrying his tax policies. I mean, they might have been decrying what they would call the Muslim ban, but they just thought he was a terrible person. That was the reason they hated him. So. What was your parallel? So there was the scandal of Donald Trump and the payoff to the porn star Stormy Daniel, Mm -hmm. who he apparently had sex with while he was married to Melania after she had recently given birth to to Barron, their son. And so Kamala Harris had was was the girlfriend of San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown. He was separated, but he was still married, legally married. And he had tons of girlfriends. And he had many girlfriends. So she there's was thirty one I mean, years younger than him. Yeah. <laughs> so people look at Trump and like, oh, he's a he's a bad person because he has this trophy wife, because he's cycled through all these women, women that are younger than him, the way that he talks about women, and here you have 
Kamala Harris, who's participated in the same kind of system of power, of disparate, disparate levels of power or influence between a high status man and a, a lower status, but younger woman who's using her beauty and her, her whatever, her intellect, whatever she has in order to win power and status and, and gain influence and further herself through it. It's just a, it's a total mess. It's a very messy situation. And so I think as Christians, we can look at both of them and say that they're not exactly parallel in every way, but there are similarities and we need to not treat those two situations unfairly. Yeah. We, we shouldn't give deference to some people because they kind of agree with our political or emotional or temperamental sensibilities while just taking a giant dump on the people that we don't agree with. Right. And not treating them the same way. If you're going to be charitable and understanding and make excuses for one party that's involved in some kind of a sin or negative behavior, something that's questionable, but on the other side of the aisle, politically, you're going to take that person and assume the worst about them and use it as a, a giant hammer to beat them down. That's not, that's not something that's honorable. No. And I think what's really bothersome or troublesome to my mind is the fact that they think praising her blackness is a good thing. That is sinful to praise someone or to elevate someone based on their race. That is ethnic hatred of everyone who is not that race. If you are elevating one person because of their race. And I think we've been, and I don't know if you agree with me in this, but I think we've been so preconditioned to, at this point, see anything that is not racist against black people so anything any type of what, what is actual real racism any type of racism that isn't racism against black people as esteemed that's virtuous we should be elevating black people we should be elevating darker skinned people and quieting down the people who are lighter skinned it doesn't and and this is where it gets into thinking like a christian and not thinking like a psychologist, not thinking like a philosopher, not thinking like thinking like a biblically minded Christian. You are in sin if you elevate someone based on their race. That's it. End of discussion. Ephesians 2 says that Christ has abolished that dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, right? And they Jews hated Gentiles. Probably more than the Gentiles even hated the Jews, right? Maybe not. I don't know. But I know the Jews hated the Gentiles. And he said, We've abol Christ has abolished the dividing wall of hostility, making instead of two men, one new man in, in place of the two. So making peace. Christ has already done that, right? This is now a broader discussion on this whole you know, racial justice issue. But Christ has already done that. You are now distracting from what Christ did and what he does to sinners by giving them hearts of flesh and by unifying all colors and ethnic groups of people into one man in him. And now you are purposely distinguishing on the basis of race. I mean, and a, a common argument against that is, and you've heard me talk about this. No, 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 no. I'm just glad we have representation. No, you're not because you would care about her character. You yeah. would say something about her character, about what she is given, what she's showing to women, what she's showing to children, what she's, what she is, um, how she is a role model to anybody. And if you actually look at her life, there are a lot of issues, especially for Christians, for being the most pro-abortion candidate and now vice president in the history of America. There, there, and I know people use this phrase way too much. There is blood directly on her hands because of that, especially since she was directly involved in helping Planned Parenthood go after the Center of Medical Progress for un doing undercover videos on them as when she was the district attorney. And they, they <laughs> Planned Parenthood 
was donating to her campaign. And then she intervened and prosecuted the Center of Medical Progress. I mean, her, her hands are so dirty in that. And if we really cared about about the glory of God, about the the goodness that God has stated in His wor- in His world, and that the or yeah in His Word, and that He gives that to us so that we can have leaders that would choose goodness and choose correctness, then you would not elevate someone and disregard their character flaws. Yeah, yeah I mean the the previous Democrat. Democratic Party platform of the 1990s was that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. But the current Democrat Party platform on abortion is to celebrate it, that it's a positive good anytime a woman exercises her right of bodily autonomy, which there is no absolute right of bodily autonomy for Christians because our, we are not our own. We are bought with a price. And even our secular laws don't acknowledge complete bodily autonomy. You can't do whatever you want with your body, especially if it's going to impact someone else. So it's an ideology that has erased the personhood or any value of the fetus, of the baby within the mother's womb. Um, it's, it, is a, it is a far more radical... So maybe Christians in the 90s who were a little bit more progressive or wanted to vote Democrat they could have comforted themselves in in the fact that the party platform was safe, legal, and rare. But that is no longer what it is. And so I I hesitate to say I mean I would I would never vote for a candidate who supports abortion. And if the opposing candidate is awful in every way, then I would just not vote because I don't want to vote for it's someone. It's not a good, bad scenario. Yeah, it's a bad, it's worse. Like, yeah, bad, worse. And it's okay to not vote for any candidate in an election where neither candidate, where you can, right. in good conscience, you can't vote for either candidate. Um, but if if you are a Christian and you lean towards voting for Democrats... You think that their party platform is better to care for the least of these, for the poor. There's a lot of debate to be had about that. And you should not just take their word for it. That because they want to throw money and do social programs and do X, Y, and Z, that that means they care more about the poor than than other people who oppose those. But if you are anti-abortion but still voting for that, then where are you at the caucuses, at the local meetings, at the city councils, at the state legislatures, where are you getting in with your representative and saying, hey, I'm voting for you because I agree with you on X, Y, and Z, but this abortion thing, you got to stop it. It's murder. It's genocide. It's evil. It's wicked. You have blood on your hands. You representatives who are voting for it, who are not defying this God, these these gods of the Supreme Court who in the 1970s legislated Roe versus mm-hmm. Wade about mm-hmm. an emanation from a penumbra, mm-hmm. this constitutional law. Uh, not, I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but from what I understand, it's not a good decision. It, I think it, pretty much any Supreme Court justice, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg, agreed that it was a terrible decision. Yeah. They might have agreed with the result because they like the the policy or the 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 consequences of it, but from a legal scholarship point, it was not well decided. So, okay, hey, whatever you know, you want to vote Democrat because they're going to give money to social programs. Okay, but what what is the what is the cancer inside that party? And it's the cancer of the culture of death towards unborn babies. And if you're a Christian and you're supporting the party, you're electing candidates from that, and you're kind of on the fence, you got to do something. You look at someone like Joe Biden who says he's a he's a devout Catholic, Catholic because he goes to he goes to mass or something like that. The Catholic Church is very clear on its teachings regarding pro life, um, and it's it's clear in a lot of other instances too. But he could say he says that he's I don't know if he he says this or not. I've heard other Democrat politicians say, well, I'm personally 
against it, but you know, it's my constituents and I'm a representative. Well, okay. You, so your constituents who elected you are for this policy. You're against it personally. You're a statesman. You're supposed to be a man. You have influence. Use your influence, your intellect, your time, your talents to advocate for what you believe is morally right and convince your constituents that they're wrong. Don't just hide behind that as a veil Lie as down. a way to maintain power. Mm-hmm. It's disgusting. Mm-hmm. How, could, how could you believe that, some, that a policy that you're forwarding is morally repugnant and yet do it and hide behind what your constituents want? It's cowardice. Mm-hmm. Convince them that they're wrong. And the, I mean, and this is obviously on both sides. We, we've, I mean, the Republic, Republicans held the presidency and Congress for a while at one point and did nothing about Planned Parenthood. Nothing. So we're lacking in statesmen on, like, oh, yeah. definitely oh, on they're all cowards. sides. They're complete cowards. Um, uh, most of them, I would say. The vast majority of them are complete cowards. But we're talking about our normal everyday people that we have conversations with that profess their believers. What are we doing about that? Because they, so many people lump in abortion as like, well, it's just like a, you know, it's a, it's just another issue. No, it's not another issue. It is the issue. It's 60 million. Yes. Children have been killed. 60 million. I mean, okay. 60 million. (laughs) It's flashing at you. Um, it's an, it's an absolute genocide. It's going back to... And it's a genocide against black people. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. And people use the guise of, oh, well, they're, you know, they, they don't have enough money. and Oh, you think that's going to help them? To be like, oh, just kill your kid. I mean, it's just such an insane cop-out. You know, it's such a cheap, insane cop-out. There is, there is no criteria applied to abortion that could not equally be applied to a living outside the womb person and used to justify their murder. Right. Never. So our, our hope, I, and, and I know a lot of people who would listen to this are probably people who agree with us. I mean, that's just kind of how it happened, how it yeah. works. But if there's anybody, anybody at all that's even thinking differently on this, I just plead with you to read your Bible and go to a church that exposits God's word. Stop going to churches that just give you a topic about, quote, how to be a Goliath or how to... No, they're not teaching them how to be a Goliath, how how to to slay a Goliath. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Yeah. How to slay Goliath, how to be a Daniel in the face of the lions. You know, stuff, I mean, just stuff like that, where it's like everything is focused on you. The Bible isn't focused on you. The Bible is focused on God and his glory and his story and what he did and who Christ is. So if you're going to a church where every topic is about what God thinks about you, if the, even the songs you're singing are all about how God thinks about you, which have their merit, right? But if that's all it's, that it's about, there's a drastic imbalance there, and I think it's unbiblical. To, especially to only think yeah. and only have sermons where it's based on you. I think... Some people that mostly agree with us, but have like some differences. We have, you know, some friends where we have this, these conversations about woke Christianity, about progressivism, etc. I know some people that um, I really respect who I know voted for Biden. I cannot get on board with that. I can't agree with that. I didn't know if I was going to vote. I didn't vote for Trump in 2016. And I was really on the fence for 2020. But then I was pretty convinced after... Just listening to some um, theologians and some much more mature and um, knowledgeable and loving men and men of faith, and I was convinced, like, yes, I think this is the, really the only option. But I totally understand for people who didn't vote for either. I couldn't get on the Biden train though, and um, but I remember one of the conversations with people that think mostly like us in terms of, you know, biblical orthodoxy, but have some, some disagreements, their, their main argument in regards to, you know, praising Kamala or voting for Biden and Kamala 
is the racial justice issue, right? Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do to rectify these issues? And so we had some, I think we mostly had some fundamental disagreements about, um, (laughs) about certain situations, certain shootings that happen where they would say, this is unjust and that, you know, why would they kill this person? And I say, it doesn't look like it's unjust to me. I think the deeper issue is human sin. Like we, you, you can't, uh, we we just had a disagreement on what actually went on. Yeah, I mean there wrong. are there are some of these shootings where the fact that it happened comes out, but very few details surrounding the shooting, video evidence, things like that don't come out, and so there's an easy narrative to attribute animus, racial animus, to the perpetrator, to the one who pulled that, pulled that trigger. Very easy to do that and to attribute victimhood and and a, a, maybe an inappropriate level of innocence or victimhood. Yeah, innocence. Yeah. Absolutely. So someone who is maybe not complying with the police, who broke the law in an egregious way, is under suspicion of having committed a violent crime... And the situation escalates, as situations tend to do when people interact. You know, not all of them, but when there's firearms involved or there's a, an authority thing with police versus an, a citizen, sometimes things escalate. And because they escalated and ended really poorly, does that mean you get to attribute motivation into the heart, you pretend like you can read into the heart of why they, why this person did what they did. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's a very, it's a very dangerous territory. Yeah, yeah, and I think the main concern isn't the fact like we wouldn't even say, oh yeah, every shooting we've seen has been totally justified. No, oh, no, no, absolutely, absolutely not. not, absolutely not, or shooting or killing, whatever has been justified, and that's that's where you have to think like a Christian. You don't want to look for your narrative to continue to be pervaded. The news has a narrative. They're jumping all over it. They see a difference in race. They put it on the news. And that's why I hear, I have certain friends that are like, do you see these shootings keep happening all the time? Yeah. Because the news hand picks and cherry picks what they want to present to you. And then if there's any issue with it, if it comes out that the person who was killed was in the wrong crickets, you don't even hear about the news story anymore. Yeah, it just disappears. But I want to talk about that but, friend. Hold, hold on, hold on a Go second, on. real quick. Okay. So you have to remember that we have a country of over three hundred and thirty million people, and there are hundreds of thousands of police to normal citizen interactions every day. And so, is it any surprise that in a country of over three hundred million people with over four hundred million firearms, that there would be violence, shootings? every so often in interactions between police and normal people, some justified, some unjustified, some murky. So the, the fact that we have a national news system and the internet that connects us instantly, Twitter, to these news stories, it makes it feel like it's local, like it's near when it's not. And that it keeps happening near. And then near. it keeps happening near. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lie. Right. It's not a lie. That, it's deceptive. Yeah. It's it's not a lie in the sense that these things are happening because there are shootings, there are bad interactions that are happening. You can tell, you can say facts, and and withhold other relevant facts. Right. And be deceiving, create a, yes. a crafty narrative. So you know you can say, yeah, white cop shoots unarmed black man, but. Does that? What if that black man was attacking the, the cop with his hands and trying to? Or was in a vehicle. Yeah, that's happened. Or it's like this man's unarmed, but they've been in a vehicle, like trying to run people over. Yeah. So it's like, well, they're unarmed. They didn't have anything. They didn't have a gun, but they had a car. So it is deceptive. Yeah, and the only way to stop them was to shoot at them or to run their vehicle off the road or you know to do something aggressive that. Yeah, it could result in harm to this person who hasn't technically been tried and found guilty in a court of law, but is doing something that is harmful. So 
that's something to remember. Every time you see the news story, the tweet, the narrative, remember that we're drawing from a sample size, a country of over 300 million people. And into waste. If you, if you ask people on the street how many unarmed black men were shot by cops in a year, they'll think it's in the hundreds or the thousands and it's in the it's in the teens or the twenties. So this media narrative has drastically altered public perception of reality. There was a recent article I was just put out that said, oh, but you know, it was over like five to ten years that said it was like two hundred or something. In it was a year. NPR, no, it was over like a five year period. But um anyway, there what there is I mean, there is something to be said that you need you should look into the numbers yourself and see where these numbers are being. But it's so hard because yeah, and you when you talk giant... about you talk about a few hundred over a multi year period in a country of three hundred million plus people. If you know anything about statistics, you can't draw conclusions about widespread trends of of racism of police to citizen a very interaction small sample size. from a data set like that. It doesn't. Like you can't. It doesn't right. make any sense. Right. There's it doesn't. So many and, factors. and for all you, or for anybody who's listening, who's like, "Oh, this is a stupid racist Madrid." It's like <laughs> you can't erase the individual stories of people who are suffering trauma and loss, of people who are killed, or even or even murdered. You know, there are stories of police who are egregiously abusing their power, who straight up murder people. Um, this, what we're saying is not the, the, the intent of what we're saying is not to erase that it's to caution, to extrapolate broad trends and formulate public policy based on such a tiny, tiny number of, and decept and the news. Yeah. Is and, and the media who's deceiving or, or people on Twitter who are deceiving by saying, a portion of the facts, but leaving some out. And so, yeah, they're not technically lying, mm -hmm. but in a court of law, it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so, yeah, well, I said, I said the truth, but I didn't say the whole truth. I, I didn't say anything that was a lie. So I got two of the three, right. But in order to have true testimony that means something, you have to have all three. And I think Exodus 23 talks about going to, it could be wrong in this specific reference, but going to a court of law. And if you are a witness to something and don't give an account, you're guilty. If you are a witness and give deference or give preference to the poor, you're also guilty. You are to be completely honest. It's really like the blindfolded Ju the, the Lady J. Yeah, who's Lady J. And has her hands out, doesn't see what you look like, doesn't just is being told ex or putting weights in her hands and she's measuring them, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, my so uh, going back to the fact that there are people who mostly agree with us, but then we will disagree maybe on what specific situation is just or unjust, number one. Number two, we could be disagreeing on the cause of all of these issues. A lot of what's really, really um, dangerous, I, and I'm, I will use that word even though it's overused, what's really dangerous for Christians is to all of a sudden assume a specific sin. Oh, it was the sin of this, right? So anytime people see disparities now, especially, I mean, what's the spotlight is disparities within racial groups, which... I don't even really buy into this idea of race, right? But, but anyway, people who look different, you know, darker skin and lighter skin, and automatically assume that's because of the sin of racism. That's the easiest one, right? Where there's a multitude of factors that are actually affecting any outcome ever. Just like when someone is in a household, or if you have kids, statistically, your oldest is going to have the highest IQ. Most of the, except for, of course, you, Phil. I know you're the middle, but you have a, a decent IQ. Mm, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's okay. It's, but the firstborn statistically yeah. always has the highest IQ. Does that mean if you apply the same logic, you, you would say, well, the parents have preference for the firstborn? That's 
probably not the reason why the firstborn has the highest IQ, right? So why are there differences in people groups? Lots of reasons. But as a Christian, how are we supposed to respond to it? Well, I think that people, pro progressive Christians, who think that this, you know, this issue, um, the main issue that's plaguing the United States is racial injustice, is racial hatred, is hatred against what they would say black and brown people or what the CRT people use is black and brown bodies. And my response is, I think you are attempting through, you know, the voting or the celebration of someone like Kamala Harris to vice president, I think you are attempting to manufacture a society that you perceive as equal all the while ignoring the fact that God is who changes hearts. You cannot make someone, quote, love his neighbor, black, white, dark, light in between, by idolizing someone's race as virtuous. You make yourself, your government, and your ide ideology your God. What do you think about that? Much has been said in the last few years, and especially the last few months, about the nationalistic idolatry of conservative evangelicals, about how they've exalted the country and the, the, the Donald and all these things. It's idolatry. It's, oh, it's idolatry. There's idolatry of whiteness, idolatry of this. And so one of the things that I've learned is whatever that I'm being accused of or that people similar to me are being accused of, just look at what the people accusing them are, are doing, and there's a good chance, almost certainly, they're doing the exact same, same thing, thing that they accuse you of. So now, to be to be fair, they're they're I mean they're kind of roping us in with people who definitely exalt Trump as some like savior. They there is a cult. There cult is a cult of Trump. Yeah, of Trump for sure. But they're kind of grouping everyone into yeah. that same group because they're not willing to deal with conservatives christian conservatives with nuance and charity and kindness in the same way they are to deal with the abortion the blm rioters or the abortionists mm -hmm. or you know x y or z mm -hmm. yeah i think i mean in principle uh, overall i agree with what you said how is there going to be like let's say we even agreed on the fact that you know, the main issue plaguing the nation was racial hatred. Let's say we agreed on that. We would say, all right, then we have to preach the gospel constantly to people. We need people to come to faith. The only way this is going to change is by God giving a new heart, right? Because we believe that no one can become good on the outside until they're actually changed on the inside. Yeah, there's this huge element of self-hatred of white people, white evangelicals. They hate themselves because of their whiteness, because of their privilege. They're confessing, they're weeping, they're going down on their knees in front of their black brothers and sisters and washing their feet. And they're confessing not their own sins, but the sins of their ancestors, the sins of the society. Just people who look like them. Like literally yeah. anyone who looks like them. Yeah. Not what they did. And so, and, and they're dealing with intense, crushing guilt. Guilt that Christians should not live with because we recognize that in Christ our sins have been forgiven. Right. Um, Absolutely, yeah. It is a... I, I have great pity for kind-hearted, progressive Christians who are living under the crushing guilt of their their original sin of whiteness. Their perception of the original sin yeah, of whiteness. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't believe in, in it to the extent, or even at all, that, that they believe in it. But I recognize that that is a, that is a terrible place to be. And so trying to understand that, you can, if, if, you, if you look at it from that perspective, it, some of the, the excesses, some of the weirdness, some of the un, unfairness and how they deal with people who disagree with them politically or socially, it starts to make more sense. Right, they, they've they're humiliated to, them 
into feeling bad. Yeah. And I think it's really humiliation. I don't think a lot of people are convicted. They're not convicted by the Holy Spirit over their whiteness. They are humiliated to the point that they feel like they're mm. convicted. And it's interesting because from some of the um, social and political commentary I've listened to about Marxism and how Marxist movements grew and exploded in the 20th century, that was a big part. The, the idea of humiliating your opponents mm. is a big part of how Marxists gained power. Right. And so I see obvious parallels within this movement of, of progressivism, progressive Christians who are pursuing racial justice. They are, they are living in abject humiliation. Mm -hmm. And they're, it, it's, it's insane. I mean, it's, it's crazy. So if you try to do everything right and be so kind and elevate black voices and you're, and you're doing X, Y, Z and ABC, then you can get accused of trying to be a good white, trying to, to do and earn the absolution. Like you, in, in this ideology, to some extent, you can never really overcome the original sin of no. your whiteness and your privilege and your power. Um, and they'll accuse you, th there's this idea of interest convergence where, well, yeah, these white people who are trying to elevate black people or, or help them out or, you know, they feel guilty. Well, they're just doing it for their own self-interest. There's no winning. So you, you can't win there. And if you, if you don't do it, well, yeah, you're a terrible racist, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't celebrate Kamala Harris as the vice president of the United States, mm -hmm. it's not because you disagree with her policies or you have suspicions about her past in how she, you know, she seems to be a cynical politician. She, there's some questions about how, how she may or may not have used her sexuality to gain influence and power early on in her career. The things she did as attorney general in California, prosecuting in favor of Planned Parenthood who was donating to her campaign or keeping people in prison past when they could have been paroled so that they could be fighting wildfires in California for extremely low wages. You know, it's not about that. It's because she's black and a woman, you're threatened of your patriarchal or... You mean if white. you say I'm not going to yeah, celebrate like her? That, yeah, exactly. It's because they attribute this motive to you without having any idea... Without asking you questions. Yeah, I know. It sucks. It's Yeah, it just, it sucks. Oh, woe, woe or us. We're such victims. <laughs> Maybe we can get some of that that uh, victim currency. So I, I at least want to end on what an, encur an encouragement for, would be. And I think part of the encouragement is, well, number one, that God is absolutely sovereign. He knows his people. He knows his church. In Philippians 1, it says that he will continue the good work he started in us until the day of Christ Jesus. And we can rest. That is something to actually rest in. Um, so that's number one. Number two, uh, whatever is happening in the world, it is going to cause the church to be refined, especially in a time where, where I mean, people are kind of being purged from the church with churches not being open, with really religious liberty, um, being able to share your faith openly, openly especially in uh places that are, are um, federally operated or state operated, you have limitations on how much biblical um, biblical truth that you can actually speak in those places. I think that that is going to serve to, um, to purify and to cleanse the church and to refine us. Um, and then, f and that's something really to celebrate because in that is great joy. I mean, it is immense joy. Um, and then also for those who have gotten caught up in it, or maybe, you know, someone who's gotten caught up in it, 
Um, again, I really urge people to get into a church and with people who think biblically first, not second. They don't use the, the Bible as a proof text. They don't use it as a way to explain their motivations or reasons for doing stuff. They're actually initially motivated by the Bible to think objectively, to think truthfully, to not show partiality. So, I mean, seek God for that. Seek God to give you a group of people that would nourish your soul, that would encourage you in the faith, that would um, really know you and not not run away from you, <laughs> not not want to make you into necessarily a social justician, but make you into a an ambassador, a real ambassador for Christ. What are you, What are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, and and remember that identity politics that critical race theory, that intersectionality, these are not transformative forces. No, only the gospel the is. The gospel, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe without distinction because all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of Christ, the glory of God, can be justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. We're being renewed by the transforming of our mind. And so someone who is hateful to God, who hates the things of God, who hates the, hates the biblical worldview, who subscribes, uh, you know, subscribes to a, a collectivist, Marxist, CRT, you know, whatever, whatever ideology it is, someone like that can be miraculously saved Mm -hmm. by God Mm -hmm. through Christ's work, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and in a moment can be changed to follow Christ, to preach the gospel. And that person, you know, they, they may slowly come more in alignment with the things of God in some ways, and in other ways it may be immediate, but the gospel is what transforms. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Well, I can tell you one thing. I'd like a drink of water. Okay. I'm going to get one. I just had to include that little ending. <laughs> Let me know if you have any thoughts. Thanks for listening.